So hello, I'm Abby Quinlan with CauseVox. Our first presenter is Charles. He's a nonprofit development and communications executive. And I'm gonna have him do his own intro when he starts his presentation. I'm sure he's a lot better at it than I am. Uh, we also have Chanda coming up right after Charles. We'll have about five minutes for Q&A and then another five minute break. And we'll bring her on for her presentation as well. So let's talk about CauseVox. CauseVox is a digital fundraising platform that has all of it. It's the best in class fundraising platform, hands on support, and a top rated education. So we allow you and support you in raising more with less time. Typically, fundraising software is pretty clunky and complex, but CauseVox gives you that seamless opportunity to really drive with it. We're able to help you modernize your donations. So you're able to replace that old clunky outdated form and make it seamless for your donors to really make that one time donation or make a pledge. And you can campaign for anything. We have the opportunity to brand your pages so it looks like your website. Everything is branded to you for your campaign. It really is seamless. And the hands-free peer-to-peer fundraising is an absolute blessing for so many nonprofits. We are able to help them raise more with less support, less need for volunteers, but increasing your network size. And of course, you'll able, you're able to sell tickets with your event. I don't know about you, but I hate having 10 different things to have to check in on as a nonprofit professional. Having everything in one place is always really, really fun for me able to check one place. Everything is there. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Chabby, it's a delight to be with everybody. I'm hopefully going to have some, some good takeaways for you today. Um, the way of introduction is, let me say it like this, we're all looking for effective major donor management. I mean, donor management for sure, but major donors is a little different kind of thing. And so what I'm calling this is taking it personally. This is an overview of successful major donor development. I originally titled it Effective Major Donor Development, but I want something a little more snappy and you'll see why in just a minute. I'm your host, I'm your guiding light through times of tumult, turbulence and challenge. And if you haven't had those, well then you will, or you haven't been doing it properly. My name is Charles. I've been serving the faith-based nonprofits for over 25 years. In addition to fundraising, my background includes broadcasting, content creation. The last 10 years, however, I've devoted pretty much to major donor development. I've worked with three international faith-based nonprofits that currently manage a personal caseload of about $2 million annually for a Christian aid mission. So all that to say, if there's a mistake that can be made, I probably made it. So anything you have or any questions you have as we go, feel free to let us know and I'll see if I can address those as we go or at the end of things. So here's what we're gonna cover. Very simply put, I have one motto, three simple rules, some suggested guidelines, and an absurdly brief overview of steps to create and sustain successful donor development for your organization. So let's get started with a story. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the film, You've Got Mail, stars Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And although I'm not personally a fan of a lot of rom-coms, this is one that I don't hate. So I've enjoyed this on several occasions with my wife. And if you're not familiar with the story, it involves a conflict between a large corporate bookstore run by Joe Fox, who is Tom Hanks, and a small independent bookstore run by Kathleen Kelly, that's Meg Ryan's character. I'm gonna give you some spoilers, hopefully not ruin it if you've not seen it, but if you've not seen it, you're probably not interested anyway. So Joe Fox manages a big box business. She, Kathleen Kelly, owns a small bookshop. She inherited from his mother. It's your typical David and Goliath story. He's David and she's Goliath. Well, Joe and Kathleen fall in love anonymously over the internet. Now they become acquainted through email, which is the title You've Got Mail. This is back in the days where the internet pretty much consisted, consisted of America Online. And Netscape, some of you probably remember that, some of you don't. I guess I'm aging myself, but it's uh, the scenario for the film. So although they are mortal enemies, he moves into her block, she's in danger of losing her bookstore. They're mortal enemies 
in person. They uh, fall in love anonymously online back when you could do that in the 80s. So here's a few lines from the film as they are discussing, as they find out who they are truly, and as they're coming together and trying to discuss their motives. And she says, why did you do that? And he says, I don't understand this. And so this is the reveal and some lines from the film. And uh, Abby's going to help me out here. She's going to play the part of Kathleen Kelly, and I'm going to be Joe Fox. Charles, before we jump into that, your slides aren't showing. And I know oh, you no. have some cool slides. <laughs> oh, no. I'm glad you said something. I'm going to end it. And I'll try sharing it again. There we go. Okay. My fault. Here's our current slide. We good? Perfect. Good. Thank you. And so I'm Joe Fox, and Abby's going to be Kathleen Kelly. Joe Fox starts off in his big reveal at the film. He ends, he says, well, it wasn't personal. <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? I'm so sick of that. All that means is that it wasn't personal to you, but it was personal to me. It's personal to a lot of people. And what's so wrong with being personal anyway? Uh, nothing. Whatever else anything is, it ought to begin by being personal. I love that line. Whatever. Yeah, thank you, Abby. I really appreciate it. Anything else, whatever it is, it ought to begin by being personal. So please remember, fundraising, if it's anything, it is intentionally personal. To some degree, you have to remember that someone's money, their funds, their wealth represents who they are. It might be wrong or right, it might be off kilter to some degree, but nevertheless, it is intrinsically tied to who they are. So we need to respect that whatever they support us with or don't support us with, it's important to them. When we're asking for their support, we're not asking just for money, we're asking for their time and their interest. So I've got a very short motto here, and I'm going to go through it very step by step. Um, this is, again, basics for most of us, but it helps, helps to go through the basics, doesn't it? Um, just to make sure we have them in, in line. And this is, this is my, my motto when it comes to major donor development. First part of it is people. I told you it was basic. This is a people business. If you don't like and respect and honor people, you're in the wrong business because it is intensely personal. You have to take it personally, especially with major donors. Now, the thing about people is that people give. It's our inherent natures to want to give to something, to somebody. If it's not, then there's probably something wrong there. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the people who want to give. So people give to what? No, it's to who? People give to people. That's an important concept to remember. I'm taking these very, very simply because it's important to build the right foundation. So it's a people that give, it's a people business, people give, but they don't just give to organizations per se, they give to people. It might be the face of organization, it might be someone who represents it, it might be you, but that's who they're actually giving to. So people give to people that they know. I know, again, it seems basic, but it helps to go over it. They don't give to somebody they don't know, they can't. How would they possibly know? So they have to know who, who this person is. So people give to people they know and they trust. Now you can know somebody and not trust them, right? So <laughs> they have to know you, but they have to trust you. And that essentially is time, building the trust. So people give to people they know and trust. Here it is, to projects and concepts that they believe in, believe it. Now notice the order there. People are first, people give to people they don't, they know, and they trust the projects and concepts that they believe in. That's your motto. Anybody that's worked with me for any length of time has probably heard me say this more times than they want. But the reason I do it is for myself. I have to remember that people give to people, they know and trust the projects and concepts they believe in. That's gonna be important as we get on the road here. 
Not very many, but I have a couple of, I have three ironclad rules that I would recommend you consider. First of all, go for the donor, not for the dollar. If you go for the dollar, there's a good chance you're going to lose the donor. But if you go for the donor, the funding will follow. It's really simple. People sense if it's transactional. It's the difference between going into a store, handing over money, and they're giving you a good or a service, as opposed to developing a relationship. It's not just the what, but the why. Why is someone giving to you? What's important to them? There's something called the pilot-like principle. You have to understand someone to know what their passions and their interests are. It's the pilot light that lights the furnace. If you've ever, maybe you have gas furnaces or a gas water heater and the pilot light goes out, there's a little light that keeps it going. If that goes out, you have to get underneath and match or a lighter or a long stemmed lighter and try to figure out where that is. But once you hit it, whew, you get that effect, right? That's what I mean by go for the donor. Find out their passions and their interests. What is it that drives them? Why are they interested in your organization? What is it? And there's usually a story there you have to find. But the important part of this is to go for the donor, not for the dollar. Also, if you're trying to develop major donors, you have to provide value to them. Why do they want to talk to you? What value do you present to them? We usually think of it in reverse terms, don't we? What value do they present to our organization? And yes, absolutely. Factor that in. That's why you're talking to them. This presumes you've done all your footwork, you've done your analysis, you've done a little bit of homework, you know who this person is, and they're at least in the right scope for you. But after you do that, you have, they have to see you as providing value so you can develop that relationship, whether it should be email, text, phone, in person, whatever it is. So rule number one, go for the donor, not the dollar. Number two, provide value for the major donor. And three, Again, pretty simple. Be honest. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. Don't say you're going to do something and then not do it. Because people give to people they know and trust. That's right. You have to prove yourself trustworthy. And part of that is being honest. I know this seems like kindergarten stuff. So helpful for me, though, to review it every once in a while. So I, these are my three ironclad rules that I've developed so far anyway. Guidelines. These are just general principles to go by. They're not quite so ironclad, but I think they're very helpful. First one I have is do no harm. Very simply put, like the Hippocratic Oath says, right? The first thing the doctors say they will promise not to do is no harm. Don't go in and make a mess of things. Respect your donor. Respect their privacy. If they want privacy, allow them that. Let me mention this. It's important for the donor to feel like they are in control all the time. It's important for the donor to feel like they're in control. And if they feel like they're being manipulated in any way, shape, or form, you're not going to build the trust that you need. So first of all, do no harm. Make sure you respect them, respect their privacy. If they don't want to talk to you, then you need to respect that and move on. The first guideline is to do no harm. Second of all, again, good guideline, the greater the engagement, the greater the giving. The more donor is involved with you by reading, going to your website, reading the emails, picking up the phone when you call, coming to the events that you sponsor, the greater their engagement in all those different areas, the greater the giving is going to be. And it's certainly like that with major donors. And this is where you end up getting your legacy gifts, your plan giving, it all comes from this, these kinds of relationships. So those are two general guidelines. First of all, do no harm. And second of all, greater the engagement, the greater the giving tends to be. Now, this is an absurdly brief overview of basic steps for major donor development. Um, first of all, there's the discovery phase. Discovery is just that. It's getting to know you and you getting to know the donor and the donor getting to know you, especially in major donors. You have to be sensitive. You have to be careful. 
and often requires a, a several pronged approach, but it's all in the discovery process. Let's go back to um, Kathleen Kelly and Joe Fox. They got to know each other over the internet, right? Now, what did they discover about each other over the internet? Well, they discovered they actually liked each other, but in person, they didn't like each other. <laughs> they saw as having, themselves having conflicting values, but they did discover one another. And that's all part of the discovery process when you're building a relationship is that you get to know them and they get to know you. And it's, if you've uh, dated, for example, it's a lot like that. I mean, after a while, you get the sense this person is interested or they're not. And if they're not interested, you're not going to do any good by pursuing it. If they've made it clear, stay away. And so you need to respect, again, do no harm and move along to the next person. So that's all part of the discovery process. And part of this discovery process, before I move on, is what I would call qualifying the donor. A qualified donor is someone who has given, not just given, of course, by definition, they're a donor. They like you because they've given you something, but you have to qualify them. They want a relationship with you and the organization. They want to know more. They want a little peek behind the scenes. Who's involved? What is this doing? Can you show me personally how I'm making a difference with this gift? They want to know. So it's not just a tax write-off. They really want to be engaged. And for major donors, they want to be majorly engaged. You know, major donors require high expectations. Not all of them, not all of them, but sometimes they do. So if you are involved with other things besides major donor development, it's real easy to get sidetracked because this is a, this is a long game. It takes you time to develop these relationships and discovery and qualifying is part of it. Second part is cultivate. That's getting to know them, then getting to know you. How do they like to communicate? Do they like to get on the phone and chat? I have some donors that I spend an hour on the phone every time I call them and I just allow for it in my schedule. And I know that's what they like to do, but they will not answer their email. They don't even have a smartphone so that you can't text them. Uh, so I get on the phone and they always, these are usually the people that like to visit with you in person too. So that's all part of the cultivation process, getting to know you, getting to know them and finding out where your passions and interests can connect. That's the cultivation process. And after you do the discovery and qualification and then the cultivation, you do the ask. This gets everybody nervous. I don't understand why. Because if you've done the proper work ahead of time, there shouldn't be anything uncomfortable at all about the ask. This should be a natural part of the process. I mean, face it, they know why you're there. They know that at some point they're going to be asked for something for your organization. Donors are smart. They're figuring that out. And they knew that when they opened their door to you, when they answered your email, when they answered your call. And so when it comes time for the ask, you can't do that out of the chute. Going back to my dating analogy, can you imagine? And I'm sure it's happened and I'm sure there's exceptions to the rule, but asking someone to marry you on the first date? Seriously? How would that go over most times? The same thing with major donor cultivation. Get to know them, let them get to know you. Find out their passions and interests and how you can connect. And then you'll have a good idea of how to tailor the ask. Sometimes it's an annual gift. Sometimes it's a monthly gift. Sometimes it's a special project gift. Sometimes the ask is just, who do you know that I should know? Who do you know that likes and appreciates this kind of organization that I would like to know? And, that, and that, when that happens, and they introduce you to their friends, you become a friend. You become one of their buddies, one of their besties. This is somebody that you will get a call from and that you will call them rather, and they'll pick your phone call up. That's where you wanna get with major donors. Is they are comfortable with you, you are comfortable with them, you're being honest. All cards are on the table and you make the ask. Listen, this year, we're coming up to the end of our fiscal year. We're shy in this one quarter. We're looking for $10,000. Is that something that you think you could do 
is that something you and your wife or you and your husband like to consider? And at that point, it should not be awkward. It should be a natural part of the process. If it's awkward, you're probably not doing it right. So there's the discovery, cultivation, the ask, and then you have to report back. And this is, there's only one thing donors want to know, just one, and it's very simple. What difference has my gift made? And that's going to vary from donor to donor, especially with major donors. Some of them are very story oriented. They want to hear the story. Tell me about somebody, one family, one person who my gift made a difference with. And you have to be ready to share that story. Sometimes what they like is an executive summary. Well, tell me what you guys did last year. You pull out your annual report, you show them the stats, you show them a few examples, and they're happy. Sometimes they're more targeted. They say, well, for instance, I do a lot of international work. Tell me what happened in Africa last year. And I should be able to pull out what happened in Africa, where the funding went, and what it accomplished. Very simple. Sounds simple. But getting everybody on the same page to get that data right is a whole other topic and a whole other seminar. So the discovery, the cultivate, the ask, and the report. Now, remember, sometimes people are happy with an annual report. You send it to them in the mail or you send them a link to the website. They say, this is great. Thanks. And you're done. Sometimes they want you to come and visit, have a cup of coffee, bring the annual report, run through it, highlight some things ahead of time. I know that you're interested in the Middle East. Here's some areas that you've helped, and this is what you've done. They love it. They love the personal touch like that. And it's actually very good. Again, if you don't like people, what? You're in the wrong business. That's right. So after the report, guess what you do? You repeat the process. And that's essentially what you're doing, is you're getting into these basic steps of, of discovering, cultivating, asking, and reporting back to the donor. So you may have heard all this before, but again, it's helpful for me to go over this again, just to make sure we have it in our minds and in our hearts and in our heads. And so it becomes automatic. It's not something that's strained. It's not something I have to do. It's something I get to do. And that's really what you want, don't you? With your donors, with your supporters, with your partners, you want them to, this is something I get to do, not something I have to do. And that's what you want. You get them to that point where it's a joy for them to participate. Yes, it's possible. I see it, and that's what I shoot for and strive for. Not at, well, it doesn't happen every day. Wished it did, but I'm still working on it. So hopefully that's helpful, these basic steps. Now, I thought to help flesh this all out, I'll give you a few stories that uh, come from my background and um, trying to be respectful, of course, of everybody's privacy, but I've, I've asked, and these people are okay with me some, sharing some generalities. Um, let me tell you about Sterling. Sterling lives in Washington State. And Sterling came on the radar of the organization I was working with um, when he was overseas. And he found out because one of our field ministries, our field partners, spoke at a church gathering he was at. And he thought, this is great. And so he, I think the initial gift was about $1,000 US. And this was several, many years ago. So when I, when I became part of the organization, and I was given a list of donors to cultivate, to discover, to cultivate, I came across Sterling's name. I called him. We chatted a little bit. I got his story. I sent him some things. And we developed a bit of a relationship through phone and through email. And after a course of about 12 months, I asked, invited him, I said, this is, you know, we're trying to develop our budget. Would you be interested in giving X amount over the next year? He said, sure. Now, whenever somebody answers right away without saying, well, I got to talk about it with my wife, or I got to talk about it with my husband. When he answered that quickly, the first thing I like to ask again, when it's appropriate and comfortable is, did I just ask too little? Because if they answer that quickly, they don't have to think about it. That's my first thought. Maybe I'm not challenging them enough. In Sterling's case, he said, no, no, this is fine. And so he has ended up becoming one of the best supporters on a monthly basis, pretty much on his own. I, I've guided him, 
but this is something he wants to do. I touch base with him three or four times a year, send him the reports, and he's happy. And he's a great guy. He's got quite a story himself, but he just loves the organization. So let me tell you about Sia. Sia lives in Florida. She and her husband retired from the Midwest, and they live in Florida. And they were in my caseload when I was handed it by the organization, and I got to know them. I, she's very sociable. Sia is your social butterfly. She's the one who loves to put things together, big events. She's very outgoing, very interested, very passionate. Whatever is in front of her, she's very passionate about. And so I keep all that in mind when I go and I meet with her and her husband, because whatever I present to her is going to be the most passionate thing she's involved with. Actually, sometimes she gets a little bit overdone with what she wants to do. And so I have to pull her back and her husband and say, listen, slow down. That's it's great. Love it. Let's keep that going. But what about this? And then she has you have to guide her. Now, with, with she is and her husband right now with their giving, um, I'm working with them. We're certainly not the organization, only organization they give to. Um, but their interests are very, very particular and um, just wonderful people. But I got to know them. I sat down with them over coffee at a Panera Bread. And they really appreciate it. They said all the time we've been giving to this organization and no one has even picked up the phone to give me a call. And so I apologize. I'm sorry. We should have. Our, it's our bad. Please forgive us. And then you move on from there. That's Sia in Florida. Randall in Louisiana. Randall is a confirmed bachelor. He's of retirement age. No children, no wife, has a brother and a sister and just loves the organization, just loves it. But he has almost sensed his whole life been waiting for something to be involved with significantly. And when he found out about the organization, he saw the pilot light go off. Whew. He said, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And it's taken him most of his life to get to this point. And it was just as easy as turning on the tap. When that happened, I, be, the only reason that happened is because someone picked up the phone, gave him a call, got to know him, ended up going and visiting him one occasion. And Randall was one of those guys. If I get him on the phone, I'm on the phone for at least an hour. And that's fine. We enjoy each other's company. I enjoy talking to him about whatever is on his mind. And of course, the organization comes in and I give him the reports. But he loves the relationship. And uh, he is an annual, very generous giver. And if you would meet Randall and you would see where he lived, there's never, you would never guess that he would be a major donor. But he is certainly an epitome of the millionaire next door. So there's Randall in Louisiana, dear, dear man. Appreciate him very much. And there's Doug in Georgia. Doug got injured on the job when he was middle-aged. And took a settlement, very generous settlement from the organization that he worked for. He ended up starting his own business. The reason for his business is so he can give more to the charities of his choice. And I got to know this from Doug because I looked at his record and saw that he had been giving for 20 years or something like that. And no one that I know of had ever personally contacted him after 20 years. I said, let me, and I called him, and the first thing I said was, what? Doug, I'm sorry if no one's ever been in touch with you, but we're so grateful for you and so grateful for your support. And he hemmed and hawed and said, thanks, but you don't have to thank me, and that's fine. That's great, in fact, but I still thanked him anyway. Went to visit him. He said, well, if you want to visit me, I'm on the job. He's a, he was a painter, a contract painter. And he said, you'll have to meet me on the, on the site and we'll have lunch together. So I brought some sandwiches, some drinks, and we turned over some paint cans, sat on paint cans in someone's yard during his break, and we talked. And that's how we met. And he told me after that, he was so impressed that I would go to his job site and sit down with him over you know, on overturned paint cans and just talk about the organization and talk about what was happening, talk about the movement that we've seen as a result of his support and others 
Doug and I have become really good friends. In fact, I hope to visit him this summer up in Georgia and have coffee with him and his wife. I know he has his first grand granddaughter coming. Two, I know his, his two girls, I met his mother. Just wonderful relationship that's developed. And um, he's been honest too. He's told me some things he doesn't like about the organization. And I said, you know what? Thank you. I am so grateful you're bringing that up because that's something that I feel like I could share with others. And that's what I've done. So there's Doug in Georgia. And uh, that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of examples, some case studies, if you will, on how major, effective major donor develops. So again, I hope that's helpful. I hope you've gleaned something, maybe a thought or two from our time. If you want to get in touch with me, the best way is through LinkedIn. I'm pretty responsive. You send me a message or you want to follow, that's great. I'd be happy to respond that way. Um, my thing is coaching. I love to coach people and get into it with them and find out what's the best, most effective way to develop major donors within your organization. So if I can help you do that, I'd be happy to do that. Just contact me via LinkedIn. I know I'm a little shy, Abby, of 30 minutes, but I want to leave some time for questions. If anybody has any questions. That's great. Everybody can drop them in their chat or um, make sure that you can drop them in the Q&A section here. In fact, I'd like to know if anybody has some tips they'd like to share. Oh, that's um, a great one. Yeah, what do you what's what has been the most important thing for you to learn with major donors? If you had to pick one out of it all, what do you think has been the most enlightening aspect of it? I'll tell you a quick story. When I was asked to do donor development, my idea of donor development was going to people that didn't want to <laughs> see you to give them money that they don't want to give. And that was a problem because that's really what I thought. But once I understood the proper principles of effective major donor development, this is what it is. It's, it's an overall positive experience. Are there problems? Of course there's problems. But if they don't walk away with a positive impression of the experience, then you need to go back, reanalyze why, and adjust and go forward. Because it really should be a truly joyful thing for them to give and support you. <laughs> Okay, we do have a question. What would you say is the most important qualification question for a major donor to be classified as that qualified donor? To be classified as a qualified major donor, what's the most important question? Yes. Okay, um, there is not one. To qualify as a major donor in your organization, that's kind of an internal discussion. Is it $1,000 annual Q? Is it 10,000? And what I would suggest is taking a list of all your donor, all the gifts and donors you made last year, do an annual QM, stacking them up and drawing a line. Here is our major donors, $500 a year, 1,000, 10,000, and work with the upper end of your file. Real simple. Again, we tend to overthink it. And I would suggest starting simple and building strong. I've been in radio, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have, <laughs> I tend to keep it short and to the point. <laughs> so we do so, have another question. Yep. Do you have any helpful ideas on how to continue to engage employees for their foundation? They do ongoing grant recipient stories and communications monthly, but any other ideas? Okay. Engage employees for a foundation. Usually that's done through an employer and that's a little different kind of thing. Um, the major donor development. Again, intensely personal. This is one-on-one. -on -one. You're the front line fundraiser. So when they see you or they see me, they see me as the organization. So through a foundation, you have the, there's a lot more layers involved there that you have to navigate, which is a whole nother seminar altogether. I know that's not much of an answer, but that's the best I can do because this, this is not that. This is a little different kind of thing. What's the best way for board members to get comfortable with building relationships? Great one, great question. I got a real simple one. 
get the board members, give them a list of major donors to call and say thank you. Nothing else. Don't ask for anything. Thank you. Just thank you. This is Joe from the Such and Such Foundation. Thank you so much for your gift. I'm a board member. Just wanted to say thanks. You want to talk? Here's my number. It does two things. It'll get the it'll get the donor excited, but it also get the board members excited, and they realize that they don't have to ask every time. What they have to do is engage the donors. I'm going to be talking about today is um, after you have those major donors. What is this approach to major donor stewardship? And the lens I'm coming from is there's a lot of kind of new school versus old school when it comes to the ways that we steward our major donors. And then I'm kind of coming at it from the approach of the, uh, there is a shift even in what a major donor looks like these days. Um, I am in the San Francisco Bay Area. So our major donors are very much shifting to younger folks who um, have come into wealth and are looking to be philanthropic and are not gonna have the same expectations of stewardship that you typically see from the um, kind of older generation of major donors. So I'm, what I'm talking about today is kind of these new school approaches and really focusing on this personalized stewardship. Um, so, as I said, I'm Shonda Lockhart and I'm located in San Francisco. Um, I have spent most of my career in education and youth serving organizations, especially grassroots orgs and small shops. So, um, small as I was the sole development person to having one to two support staff. So, a lot of what I've done is like nitty gritty in the weeds. Um, and um, just a little bit about me too, as I'm data obsessed, I, um, you'll see some of that in this presentation and I'm striving toward community centric fundraising. So if, um, you don't know about that, uh, visit community centric fundraising.org. It's got some really great information about how we move from being donor centric to mission centric, um, and en engaging our entire community, which is important as part of the major donor conversation. So as we are getting, um, going into this today, here's some assumptions I'm making. Um, you have your tracking data about your major donors. You have some kind of CRM in place, whether that's Razor's Edge or Salesforce or something along those lines, or even an Excel spreadsheet. You are definitely tracking the gifts that are coming in and you know who's making those gifts. Um, also, this is your role in the organization in some capacity, whether it is you um, that is actually doing all of the stewardship or that you're instructing others on the stewardship that you need to happen. So maybe you're assigning tasks to trustees or your executive director or someone else, but it is your role to instigate those things. Um, and that the gifts have been made. So uh, a lot of what Charles was talking about was prospecting. I am not talking about how to get the donors. My assumption is you already have them. So um, here are kind of five of my foolproof approaches to major donors. They've worked so far. Um, and the outcomes that I expect from them are donor retention. This means I'm keeping them year over year. I'm upgrading their gifts and moving them up from maybe 1,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 over time. Also, I'd put in there with upgrades is mult from one-time gifts to multi-year gifts. Um, and then we're establishing a relationship with the organization um, and that they're highly engaged uh, donors. So the groundwork that I wanna talk about that you need to lay before you can do these kind of five tips that I'm talking about um, is that, is there a relationship with you, the organization or a board member or another, another donor? This is something that you really need to understand about the donor. Um, and ultimately what we want out of major donors is that their relationship is with the organization. And so everything you're doing in terms of stewardship is creating this stronger bond with the organization's mission. Um, when you have a major donor who's tied to a board member, if that board member rolls off, you usually lose that major donor relationship or they significantly de decrease their giving. Donors tend to follow their friends or their connections connections. And the same thing goes of like, for me in the organization I'm in now, our executive director is going to be transitioning out. And so many of our donor relationships have been tied to her. So since we knew of her plans to transition, we've really um, started planning around what it means to move those relationships over to the organization core as a core relationship, but also to me so that I can continue to steward them as mission centric uh, relationships. The other thing is personalization that I, you really want to make sure you're thinking about in everything I talk about today and your approach. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is like, oh, well, we sent out that newsletter. 
that's not enough when it comes to major donors. Um, you know, oh, they got this email. That's not enough if it was a mass email. So what can you do to highly personalize from their first names in something, their total giving, uh, graphs that are related to things that they support? And we'll get into that more, but the personalization is key. Also really understanding donor intention. So every, all donors have different reasons that they give, and that's something that you should understand. Something that um, I know to be true about the donor bases I've worked with is uh, there are donors who do reciprocal giving. So um, they, their friend you know, reaches out to them and says, I really want you to support this organization I'm with, um, or it's a board member, and they say, you know, come to my event. We're putting on this gala. You, know, you should come. And their friend is like, well, you know, you came to my gala. I know you made you made a gift of 5,000 at that event, so I'll come to yours and I'll do the same. This is a very common practice. If that's your donor's intention is that it's just a reciprocal gift, you need to know that so that you understand what kind of stewardship are you doing. Are they interested in a long-term relationship with you with the organization or is this a one-off? What kind of work do you need to put in to transition that from one-off to long-term? Uh, the same thing with donor intention. I know that we have donors that are, um, you know, I want my gift to support this and this is what it does. That is not always helpful to us, but that is another thing around community-centric fundraising that we need to make sure we educate donors that there are um, general operating support to, that allows us to function and run this amazing organization is the best use of major donor dollars. Um, it's not always these earmarked named buildings and things like that. So um, no matter what, I just kind of make sure you understand what your donor's intention is when they're making that gift. The other thing you really wanna make sure you have in place are you know, donor pipelines and plans. So Charles referenced that he found this donor that um, you know, in all of their time giving to the org had maybe never been reached out to. That is someone who fell through the cracks or through one of your pipelines. You really wanna make sure you have a plan in place from the day that major gift is made through the end of your fiscal year and an ongoing cycle. When he you know, gave that timeline of you do all of your research and then the ask, you get the gift and then repeat, you need to make sure you're maintaining those relationships and they don't just fall off because oh, you got the gift and now the deal is done. You are always thinking about retention, upgrading and multi-year gifts with major donors. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into um, kind of my first tidbit and this is gonna feel like really low hanging fruit, but ask the donor. Um, you know, how do you engage with organizations that you support? This is a question I just asked a donor last week. Um, we had, he's been an ongoing donor at a pretty substantial amount, um, but I know that his connection to us is waning. Um, and so I wanted to make sure before that transition happened, um, this is a uh, board member rolling off that we could sit down and have a meeting about um, what long time, like long-term giving looks like to our org after his time um, on the board. And, you know, we had a really great meeting. There was a multi-year commitment made. Um, but something that I didn't know, if you're not on the board and I don't see you all the time at our board meetings and I don't have a way to get in touch with you, how do you want to now be engaged? That's a different question. I've known this person for four years, but it doesn't mean I know the answer and because the answer is going to change now. I asked, you know, and he makes um, his uh, gifts through a foundation and it's a, his family foundation. I asked, you know, do you have reporting requirements? Is there anything that you appreciate? Like what has worked for you? What doesn't? Um, how can I best keep you in the loop of what's going on here? And that was critical. I discovered that um, they don't like uh, in-person meetings. They don't like, um, they don't wanna come visit the school, like us at our school. They're not interested in that. Um, and they don't require grant reports. What he wants is just these touch points that I have always done. He likes to know what's going on and he'll tell me if he wants anything else. That's not what I would have instinctually done with a gift of this size. I would have been like, let's go to lunch. Let's do this. Let's get you here. But I had to, I have to now shift what I'm going to do in my plan based on what he needs and he wants. And so um, I really like, it seems so simple, but make sure you're asking that question. This is one where I think of like in development world, we all need to have a little bit of a, a stalker vibe. Just learn everything you can about this donor. And if you're just starting this in your practice and you already have a major donor base, look at that list of donors and make sure you can answer these questions. Do you know where they work? 
Do you know what their education background is? Do you know who's in their family? And that's kind of like at their immediate family at home. Do they have children? Do they have a multi-generational household? Um, all of those kinds of questions. If you know the names of those people, that's even better. Um, software like iWave or other donor prospecting software can help you learn these things. LinkedIn, the, the internet is, you know, flush with this information. Um, that's also where you would want to find information about like their wealth and their network. I use iWave and LinkedIn for this. Who are they connected to? Um, what are some relationships they might be able to share with us? Their opportunities for making connections is another way a major donor can make major gifts to you. And you're like, oh, I've been trying to reach out to this foundation. They're actually friends with a person who's on the board of that foundation. And I bet they'd make an introduction if they're giving you a major gift. So those are the kinds of things you want to make sure you're abreast of and you know kind of all the time. Um, I do this every summer. So I want to make sure that I any information has changed. People pass, people get divorced, kids go to college. Um, you want to kind of keep updating that information annually. And I set aside time in the summer, which is my um, slower period, to do that. And most importantly, their passion points. When you're connecting with them, you don't want to tell them about a program they don't care about. Going back to that um, gift that we just closed last week, um, you know, we had kind of a menu of uh, programs or things we're pitching to major donors right now. And we were looking at it and it's like, well, you know, it could be this, but no, you know what? Every time I've talked to him, he taught, he tells me things about um, how much he cares about food insecurity in um, our, in San Francisco and how during the pandemic, he was making sure he was giving to the food bank and making sure that kids were not without food. Well, we have a summer academy where we have students here all summer in a free program and it ensures they have access to food over the summer. And these are high risk um, families, vulnerable families who typically are going to have issues with food insecurity. So we talked about the summer academy, you know, how important it was academically for students, all of that, but then made sure we talked about this food insecurity piece and food access. And that's what got him. If I didn't know that passion point, it wouldn't have closed that easily. So make sure you have a way in your CRM, your spreadsheet, however you're tracking of all of this information about your donors. Okay, so one of the things I've started doing is investment reports. This is a labor of love. This is something, again, I dedicate time to um, and they have paid off and I can't recommend them enough. This is not your annual report though. This is something that is going to be um, much higher level than an annual report. It's not a bunch of narrative and storytelling. This is like, how is your money at work? And show them the data of what their donations have done. And these are, again, highly personalized. So I typically, I create one report. You can do this in uh, PowerPoint, Google Slides. I use Canva, which is free for nonprofits. Um, and I design a template. And then I go through and I edit it for each donor with their giving amounts, the things that they're passionate about, and then I save it out as a PDF. I send it to each donor individually that is personalized email for me. And also, so you know, typically what I'm doing is I'm just copying and pasting from a Word doc of an email I've written. I jazz it up a little bit to personalize it and send it off. I get 100% open rate on these and um, because I track through my email and I am getting probably a 40 to 50% response rate of people being really excited. And that response rate is either, either in the moment people reply to the email or later in conversation, they're like, oh, remember that report you sent me? So I know that it's hitting home and it's what people want. I'm going to show you a couple examples of the slides that I include in that report, um, just so you can kind of have a sense of what I'm, uh, what I'm saying. So this is the cover page of that report, your investment in big dreams. And it's um, the reason I use the word investment here is because I'm targeting the donor, the kind of startup culture, um, Silicon Valley culture donor of who's investing in something. They, that's the language they think of, of when they think about what I'm putting money into and what's coming out of it. And then the um, the next page in this, whoops, let's go back, is kind of a welcome. So thank you for your incredible uh, investment in our schools. And here you see Mary and John, I've replaced their names. And then you can see your personal giving of $510,000 and partnership this year have been instrumental to our commitment to do right by our students. And so this is something where I've gone through and I've made sure that it, the, uh, their total giving for the year lines up with their name on this slide. And then next we have, um, this is, we had a group of donors 
who donated to the sustainability fund. And this was kind of in reference to um, distance learning and pandemic and kind of the uncertainty of state funding for public schools. And so this donor was one of three donors. There's a white, yellow and purple, and they knew they were one of three donors. So it's kind of them showing me showing them look at the impact you've made with these two other people across the next five years. And then this is, you can see in the top um, left corner there, this is, you know, slide six of 16. So I really build these out. I have interchangeable slides depending on those passion points. I knew that this donor was especially interested in what we were doing for our families during distance learning. So I'm giving them, here are these six real tangible things that we did with your donations. We distributed 800 laptops. We were able to do one-on-one -on -one family case management. We had to train teachers on the tech. We had a COVID site coordinator. We had on-site testing days. These are all these things that I can say are tangibly happened because of their giving. So um, you can kind of figure out what are the important critical things you wanna share, create these, um, have them ready so that you kind of have a deck for yourself that you can send out to donors, and it might be at the end of your fiscal year, it might be mid-year, you can kind of pick out when the right time to do it. You could save it as a stewardship touch point, right, you know, three months before your ask so that you're ready. And that kind of gets into my next um, piece here, which is a slide I'm gonna show you that I include in this investment report. What's next? What's your next campaign, your next event, your next appeal? Plant that seed. And I do it in the investment report, um, you can make sure you're just doing it in ongoing conversations or touch points you're having with your donors, but what's next? So I include this, this is one of the last slides in there, what's coming next year? And what I'm doing is I'm getting us ready for the next ask, I'm planting the seed. So, you know, we're gonna have to return to campus. This was from last school year, we returned to campus this school year. Um, you know, we're gonna have to return to campus. That's gonna cost us money when we have to figure out kind of hygiene and sanitation and health and safety issues, COVID uh, testing coordination. We're also launching, launching this alumni council. We're launching an induction program, which is a way teachers clear their credential. We're putting on educator institutes. We're having hybrid events and our class of 2022 is gonna have to graduate. So I'm making sure that I'm introducing these talking points for the next time me and the donor meet. So staying in touch, this is my last one that I have here that I feel is really important. Um, I feel like the way, the, the most personalization that I do in the relationship I, building I do, um, and again, kind of acknowledging this shift in donor interest and priorities is email. I have seen a significant drop off even before COVID, this is not kind of pandemic related, is people are not as interested in site visits. They're like, I trust you and what you're doing with my money. I don't need to come see you do it. Um, I also feel strongly when it comes to community centric fundraising that we're not a dog and pony show. We don't owe donors access to our young people and to vulnerable populations. So, um, you know, I think donors are starting to learn that. I think people don't have bandwidth for it. And I think there's a lot of trust that you want to make sure you've built up that they, your donor trusts that you're doing what you say you're doing with the money and they don't really need to come see you do it. So, um, I have planned quarterly touch points. So I have a, you know, for us, we have a quarterly e-newsletter that goes out. Once that has gone out, same day, I take that email and I forward it individually to my major donor list. And it's with a quick note that says, Mary and John, just wanted to make sure you didn't miss this. Here's my favorite article with a quick link. You don't want to miss this one. You know, th these two students and our most recent one, we had two students who their capstone project was to build a, um, uh, solar panel on top of our garden that controls the watering system for our, our urban garden. This is an incredible project. Both kids want to um, major in uh, structural engineering. So this is just a really fun, cool story to share, especially when so many folks in our donor base are in the engineering and um, kind of uh, ingenuity space. And so I just forward that along with a little brief thing, and that's my quarterly touch point. I also do sporadic updates. So last week, we had, we've had a busy couple weeks. Last week, we had um, one of our students was on TV and on KQED with our governor of California talking about, we have a kindergarten to college savings plan that California has introduced where every public school child starts with 
this bank account with money in it and you continue to save money in it. It's to help um, kind of raise money for college and save money for college. So our student Talia was on TV and on KQED and we got the clip, we pulled the clip offline and had a little, it was three sentences. And I was like, you won't believe this. Look at this, this is amazing. Talia's on TV with the mayor of San Francisco and the governor of California. And look at her and what she's talking about and how she's gonna study to become a psychiatrist, how she's gonna use this money when she goes to college next year. Um, yeah, and by the way, we have an event on the May 14th. Here's an invitation to that, hope to see you soon. What I did with that one is I was able to, I use um, G Suite at work. You can do this on Outlook um, and whatever, most email services let you do this. Um, I use Mail Merge through um, a Google add-on so that I can have it, I write it in a Google Doc, and then you're able to connect it to a spreadsheet um, and have it merge emails for you that say, Dear Mary and John, I loved this. Like, here's Talia, blah, blah, blah. And we have this event on May 14th. And it came from my email address. It said their name in it. And it looks like it. I sent them all individually, but I was able to send out 75 emails in two minutes. And so again, personalization, but also speed. Um, and that was what I do with the sporadic update. Um, the videos that I've done um, are typically um, the uh you know just an update from the community um and so what i've tried to do is i get a teacher in our case so that might be your program staff um sometimes it's a student like we are having decision day today where all of our students are talking about and announcing what college they're going to go to so i'll go to that i'm going to get a student to record a video for me that says like this is the the school i've decided to go to i'm super excited here's why i'm going there and I'm gonna send that out to my major donors next week. Um, there is a service called Bomb Bomb. It's not the greatest name in my opinion, but B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B, bombbomb.com. They have a nonprofit uh, free version that you can use. It's all I've ever needed. I don't pay for it. Um, and uh, I, I randomly send out these little videos. Um, I sometimes, it's, like I said, from teachers, our executive director. Uh, we had one from one of our school mascots one time sending out an announcement. And so I like to do those. They also get really great response. I've had people, you know, tweet them and share them on Instagram. Um, and we've, it's been really good way to kind of spread the news about what's going on. So there's kind of a ton of ways that you can engage your board, your executive director, your program staff, the rest of your development team and all of these efforts. Um, but I think it's really core to thinking about what is your year long uh, strategy for major donors and how are you fitting these things in a way that feels organic, that feels like you really do know and you do know your major donors, but that they feel connected to the organization. And that's that miss mission centric connection as opposed to just this kind of personal relationship they might have with a donor or a staff member. So I have some time for some questions. I just spoke very quickly, but I don't know if there's any questions about kind of anything we just talked about. So the Google add-on um, is called Mail Merge. And so if you, um, when you're in your, my, in your Google uh, doc and the top there's add on, and then if you drop down, you can go to like the Google shop and you can find mail merge. Um, it is free up to, and there's a limit. I think it's like a hundred merges at once. It's typically free. And then if you do more than a hundred emails at once, it's like $40 for the year. So I just pay for it annually. So I always have it. Hey, Shonda, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, talk about your engagement. Uh, you said the emails dropped off. Have you seen a pickup in video engagement? Um, our emails haven't dropped off. Um, I'm sorry. But our um, in-person visits, the interest in in-person visits dropped off Has quite dropped a bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, and meetings, like people, it's kind of seem, people seem just busy. I think it's not having the time for it, but video engagement is high. So BombBomb lets you track the open rate and if they share it. And so I love watching those. It's a little addicting to like watch how it like bounces around and how many people open it. Um, you can't see like, Charles, if I send you a video and you forward it to Abby, 
I don't see Abby's email address as having opened it. I just see yours having opened right. it twice. Right. So it tracks the original recipient as the opener each time, but I can see the number of times you shared it because there's a share button. Um, and so I see those do really, really well. So you've seen an increase in the engagement level on bomb bomb as you've used it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Um, and it's, it's not a social media platform. So mm -hmm. the engagement is just saying like they opened the videos and they shared them, um, with their friends, but that's, it would come to you as an email. Yeah. Um, okay. and so you just kind of pass it around. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, it looks like how often do you call a major donor? So that's, um, for me, that really depends on if the major donor likes phone calls. Um, not all major donors do, and they're not, they're kind of like, why are you calling me if we don't have a planned phone call and they haven't asked for it? Um, I have found email to be the way that I've done a lot of the relationship building to get us to a point of being on the phone or, and I, even for me, I prefer like, let's go to coffee or lunch, um, rather than be on the phone. And if we do a phone call, it's usually just a quick, um, touch point about something very specific there. I have a reason I'm calling. Um, I don't like to do surprise phone calls for major donors. That's a great point. I, I agree, Chandra, but I think you also have to, how does the donor want to be contacted? Right? Yeah. And that's the I, question, right? I, I, I actually, I've gotten to the point, if I can text them, we're on yep. a good, we're on a good, good level playing field there. Yeah. A hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to keep them coming into the chat. Okay, well, I wanna thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Charles and Shonda for doing such great presentations. They will be recorded and shared with everybody who signed up. So I'm really excited to see where this goes and thank you very much for all the great content. Thank you. My pleasure.